How heavy is one of these bunches of bananas? Oh, this fella here is probably around 40 kilos. These boys here could carry up to a thousand of those bunches a day. So, <laughs> we'll keep you fit, mate. We'll keep you fit. Behind this biosecurity fortress is one of Australia's most protected fruits. A banana variety chosen 60 years ago to be the perfect mix of taste, yield and disease resistance. We've got to do the boot thing, so do the change of boots. I'm here to find out what makes this banana so easy to grow and so popular with our palate. So this whole property is full of Cavendish bananas, one variety, that's all we grow here. And 95% of the bananas sold in Australia are all Cavendish bananas. So Cam throws me in at the deep end with what they call banana humping. Do I need the shoulder pad, Cam? Yeah, mate, this here is to protect the bunch, mate. We're not looking at your shoulder. We just want to make sure the fruit gets looked after. So whack that one on. And how heavy is one of these bunches of bananas? Oh, this fella here is probably around 40 kilos, so make sure the knees are ready to go. In the world of fruit, the Cavendish is near perfect. I'll uh, put a bit of a scarf in the tree. I can bring Seedless back and shoulder. delicious, it has extraordinary horticultural vigour. So if you just step in underneath there, mate, you just take the weight. Yeah, have you got him? Yep. All right. Off you go, mate. Over the trailer. <laughs> Every bunch we hump can weigh up to 70 kilograms, and the fruit grows year round. How many of those a, a day would these boys be doing? So, these boys here could carry up to a thousand of those bunches a day. So, <laughs> we'll keep you fit, mate. We'll keep you fit. Right, Dave, off you go. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> oh, that's stupid. Super... There could be as many as 300 bananas in this big bunch. the ultimate consumer crop. Right Today, on, when go. we buy, look at, or eat a banana, it's most likely a Cavendish. It's come to define what a banana tastes like. Smooth, creamy, with just a hint of sweetness. This place is just unrelenting. So I'm a little stunned that after harvesting a bunch, they just chop the plant down. And so how do you propagate them? Are they all related as a plant? Yeah, we either propagate them vegetatively, so off the base, you can actually take some suckers off, plant them in the ground, that'll grow a new tree, or they go through a laboratory and they're cloned. So genetically, pretty much all of the trees, or all the bananas in this plot are the same? They are definitely identical. They are exactly the same tree. And does that leave the industry and your farms vulnerable to, to like pests and disease? It's a major issue. You get the one that takes out that variety, you've, you've got to replace the whole farm. So it's a massive issue. It's this lack of genetic diversity that has put the perfect banana at risk. A deadly fungal disease lurks in the soil, and there's no known cure. What kind of mortality rate is there in banana plants when the TR4 gets in there? Once it's established, it's 100%. One, it doesn't miss? Doesn't miss. Wow. It's already taken out all the Northern Territory. Everything? Everything. The whole lot? The whole lot. So no one is growing Cavendish bananas in the Northern Territory at the moment? If you grow them, they will be dead within a couple of years. That's incredible. Yeah, and it so, is. So you might, you, as a Queensland grower, you must be you must be really concerned about that coming to your crop. Well, it will move in water, uh, and we're in the wettest place in Australia here. So you get a, a, a big rainfall event, and it washes from your farm down to the to the neighbour's farm. It will follow. It's bad news for banana lovers. Farmers like Cameron fear the Cavendish could be extinct around the world in as little as five years. So I've come to the South Johnston Research Facility. There we go. Oh. Jeff, have a look at this. Scientists here are hot on the trail of a solution. This is looking a little different to the banana farm I was at yesterday. I mean, it's, it's wild in here. 
Yeah, a bit messy at the moment. We've been letting the plants multiply as they naturally do from their large rhizome system below ground. They're creating new varieties of bananas. Somewhere in this field might lie the disease-resistant genetics for the next generations of bananas we eat. Oh, immediately you can see there's some different little yeah, pink pretty colours, that orange, eh? It's a banana germplasm, a collection of 220 different varieties from around the world, lovingly cared for by botanist Jeff Daniels. Even just looking around this little plot here, there's a huge amount of variety. I mean, there's some long, thin ones up there. Like, these plants themselves are much thinner. The leaves are different. I saw some, like, red flowers and a little pink bunch coming in. Uh, so what's the purpose of keeping a plot like this? For a whole lot of reasons. In particular, these days, these varieties represent an amazing resource in terms of their resistance to pests and diseases of bananas. As we explore under the canopy, the diversity of the banana simply astounds me. Wow. Huh. It's a banana arc of different shapes. These bananas are massive. Textures and taste. It looks like button up pumpkins. <laughs> yeah, and they're delicious. Coming! Even bananas with seeds. They'll turn brown and they'll get harder as they get more mature. All from a plant I'm amazed to learn isn't even a tree at all. Oh, Jeff, have a look at this one. No woody tissues in that one, That Paul. is massive, Jeff. I can only just get my arms around it. I can't believe it's a herb. And among all this diversity, one particular variety has caught Jeff's eye. It's called the Goldfinger, first bred nearly a century ago for its ability to fight fungal disease. But it has one big problem. A little bit different to your Cavendish banana, which is the main market variety. A little bit more acidity in the fruit. Not all consumers will like it quite so much. So it's on paper, it's great for a commercial farmer, but when it comes to the consumer, it's not quite as appealing. Because we've all grown to love the taste and texture of the Cavendish banana, Jeff and his team are genetically re-engineering the Goldfinger to taste more like one. Well, what we want to do is try and accelerate the process of variation that occurs naturally through bananas. They've created a paddock of mutants. 600 goldfinger tissue samples were exposed to powerful gamma radiation, a non-GM technique used by scientists around the world since the 60s to create lots of genetic changes quickly, instead of waiting for them to evolve. It causes some variation to occur in the plant, in a whole range of plant and bunch characteristics, and also, more importantly, in this case, changes in the taste and eating characteristics. And I'm one of the lucky few to get a taste of the future. From the paddock of mutants, Jeff and his colleague Stuart have narrowed it down to a handful, one of which may end up on your breakfast cereal. Now I can see that's going right back towards that Cavendish. It has like a, it has a firmer texture, it has less acidity. I'm literally tasting how the firmness, sweetness and tanginess of the original Goldfinger has been changed by this process. Mmm, but that's even sweeter again. Yeah, but I like that. That's what we're looking for. And the results mm. are very tasty. So that, to me, tastes like it's got a lot more of that classic gold finger tang to it, but it has a very appealing texture as well. So I can see what you're doing here, you know, with all this genetic variation, you're looking for that, the magic bullet one that ticks all the boxes. That's it, the, the, the mutation process is, is random. So we're really just trying to find the right combination of characteristics. Hmm. And one of the key characteristics that we need to be able to confirm is that they still have the same resistance as the original gold finger. So there's a little more testing to come for the banana of the future. But for now, the pick of the bunch for my taste buds is the one that's a bit tangy, but with just enough sweetness. I'd say the 423, if there's any uh, any sort of credence to, to my opinion on that. That's uh, yeah, write it down, Jeff, excellent. Get and, that on paper, Jeff. And to me, I mean, that's quite exciting to think that, that you know, standing here in, in the research station, that 
I've tasted a banana that has been in development and potentially will be something that's enjoyed by people all over the country. And I think, I think this is a time when banana consumers are going to see more change in the variety space than they've probably seen in the last 40 years. <laughs> if you're looking for anyone to name them after, I uh, know, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the West banana, maybe? No, nah, it's... Uh, uh, well, look should, at that, it's a bit should... wonky. That probably should be a West one. But for the 423 banana, there's a long way to go. Right now, there's just one of them in the world. Row four, tree 23 in this paddock. This has been an incredible insight into how we can develop a taste for our food. The banana really is an ongoing experiment. And I can't help wondering what my fruit bowl might look like if we broadened our palate to include a few more of these bananas I've seen today.